So in previous units, we talked about first JavaScript itself as a programming language, and then we also covered HTML, the document format used for web pages. And now in this unit, we're going to bring the two things together. We're going to talk about how in the browser you can use JavaScript code to inspect and manipulate the web page. Now what's called the DOM, the document object model, that's a standard for expressing documents as a big hierarchy of objects which can be inspected and manipulated by some programming language, in this case by JavaScript. Now in the DOM of a page, as we call it, you have a bunch of objects and they're arranged in a hierarchy, and each object is a node in that hierarchy. It's basically just one big tree, and the root of that hierarchy is usually something called a document object, a document node. And that document node has children, and those children themselves can have their own children, and so forth, in one big tree. And these children nodes, most of them are called elements. Basically, every tag in an HTML document ends up as an element in the DOM. Every p tag, every div tag, every span tag, every anchor tag, etc. Those all end up as elements. And each element itself can have children, and these children are going to be other elements, or attribute nodes, or text nodes. If a tag in your HTML has an attribute, that shows up as an attribute node, which for some reason is abbreviated as ATTR, that's what they call those nodes. And if a tag has in its content other tags, those show up as child elements, and if the content of a tag has text in it, the text shows up as text nodes. So again, the DOM is just an expression of our document, in this case HTML, as a big tree of objects, a bunch of node objects all arranged in one big tree. And the point of all this is that the browser exposes the DOM for that page to any JavaScript code included in the page. So how do we get at the objects of the DOM so that we can inspect them and manipulate them? Well, when the browser runs JavaScript code, it defines a global variable called document, which is assigned to the document node of the page. Now, the document object, and in fact all of the nodes, have a property called children, which is basically an array of all the children of that node. And so we could actually, from the document object, look at its children, and then look at the children of its children, and the children of its children of its children, and we could walk all the way down the whole hierarchy to access any element, but this is a very cumbersome way to do it. So the document object actually provides a few very useful methods for more conveniently getting at certain elements. The two most commonly used are the methods getElementById and getElementsByTagName. GetElementById does pretty much what it sounds like. It returns the, the single element with the ID of the specified argument. So here, document.getElementById with the argument of foo, that will return the element which has the ID foo. GetElementsByTagName is also pretty self-explanatory. Note it says elements, plural because we're returning more than one. And in this case, what this will return is it will return all elements in the document which are of type div. And it will return them as an array. In what order, I'm not certain. It, it may have a, a guaranteed order that it goes from top to bottom or something like that. In truth, it's really not all that important because getting all the elements of a certain type is not something we typically do very often. So this method is really not all that useful. Get element by ID is pretty much the workhorse for accessing elements. Now, of course, in our HTML, we don't necessarily give every element its own ID. That's generally not a good thing to do. But in practice, the most common way to access elements without their own ID is to access some ancestor, and then from there walk down the tree to the element that we're actually trying to access. So, for example, we might have a div with a bunch of p tags inside it, and we want to do something to every one of those p tags, well, the div, we would give an ID, and we'd access it with get element by ID, and then we could just loop over all of its children, which are the p tags, and that's how we can get at the p tags there. Another essential method of the document object is create element, which, as the name implies, creates a new element, which you can then insert anywhere into the DOM. So you can actually change the page on the fly by creating some element, like, say, a paragraph, and then inserting it somewhere. Now, from here, I could go into more detail about the document object and all of its other various methods, and from there, we, we could cover the other types of node objects in the DOM. But the DOM has this problem that the various different browsers 
don't uh, implement it exactly the same way. There ends up being some differences uh, between the DOM as implemented, say, in Firefox and the, and the DOM as implemented in Internet Explorer. And in many cases, these uh, differences are, are very minor, but they're all very annoying. And on top of this, the DOM is not that well designed of an API from the perspective of someone wishing to inspect and manipulate the content of a web page. It's just a bit clumsy and kind of haphazard in how it came about. In practice, when it comes to programming JavaScript in the browser, it's a very good idea to use an abstraction layer over the native DOM. And by abstraction layer, we mean basically a JavaScript library which uh, exposes to you more convenient uh, objects and methods for doing the same business. So in fact, for most of the rest of this unit, we're not going to talk more about the DOM per se, we're going to talk about jQuery, which is the most popular such JavaScript library. Now, jQuery and similar libraries aren't total abstractions over the DOM, they don't cover all of the functionality of the native DOM, so to do certain things you will occasionally have to deal with native DOM objects, and just as a matter of competence, it, it's easier to understand jQuery and use it effectively if you understand what exactly it's abstracting over for you. In any case, I do strongly suggest you use jQuery. Um, at the very least, it spares you from having to deal with a whole bunch of annoying uh, cross-browser differences and, and little quirks. What you'll find when you write your code to use the native DOM straight with no abstraction layer like jQuery is that you'll get mysteriously different behavior in different browsers because of some subtle difference between the browsers. When you use jQuery, you don't have those problems as much because jQuery tends to compensate for the differences between the browsers. So now, if you want to use jQuery, or any other JavaScript library for that matter, how do you do so? Well, in the page, you simply include a script tag with a source attribute with a URL pointing to the JavaScript code. Typically, we put JavaScript in files ending in .js, but that actually isn't strictly required. You could actually call it whatever you want. But in any case, looking at this example, here we have two script tags. First, jQuery.js, which presumably is the jQuery library, all in one file. And we also, after that, have mycode.js, which is presumably the code I've written for my site. And the first thing to note here is that the order is important, because the browser will execute the JavaScript basically just top to bottom in order that it appears in the document. So you want the jQuery library to run first so, so that its uh, objects and methods get defined in the global namespace such that we can then use them in our own code. So you always put the libraries you want to use first and then your own code. Now in both these script tags, the source attribute is a relative URL. So assuming the browser has retrieved this page from the URL http colon slash slash example dot com slash index dot html it then interprets the relative url jquery dot js as example dot com slash jquery dot js the browser will make a get request to example dot com slash jquery dot js and whatever it gets back it interprets as javascript code likewise with mycode dot js the browser would look for that as example dot com slash mycode dot js so in practice, what this means when you want to use jQuery on your website, you go to jQuery.com, you download the latest jQuery library, you uh, take that file, you put it up on your web server and make sure it's accessible at a certain URL, and then in a script tag in your own pages, you uh, have the URL either relative or absolute that points to that file, which is the jQuery library. Now, you'll also notice that we've included a meta tag with the attribute charset of utf8-8. Charset here is actually a bit of a misnomer because it's specifying a character encoding, not a character set. But in any case, we include it here because the jQuery library is in utf8. And while most browsers can most of the time correctly guess what the character encoding is supposed to be, sometimes they guess wrong. That's why it's a good idea to make this explicit. Here's a more complete template for an HTML page using jQuery. Notice we have the doc type declaration at the top. Doc type HTML is what is prescribed by the HTML5 standard, so it's it's a good thing to use moving forward. In this example, though, we made two differences with the script tags. First, the one that contains our code, the code we're going to write. Um, we're just going to include that written in the page itself. You know, we don't have to put it in a separate file. We can just put it in the page. It's just that if we write a lot of JavaScript code, it tends to make sense to put it in a separate file. <laughs> 
And in the script tag above that, you'll notice we're including jQuery with an absolute URL pointing to a file hosted on jQuery.com. So rather than downloading the library and throwing it up on our own web server, we're just relying upon the file hosted on jQuery.com. A few other sites like Google also host the jQuery library uh, in this same fashion, basically as a public service. And in fact, in most cases, websites that want to use jQuery, 99% of the time it makes the most sense just to let jQuery or Google host it for you rather than having to put it up on your own website and it ends up saving you and your users bandwidth because the jQuery library is not actually terribly big. The core of it's only about 30 kilobytes, but once you get many users, that begins to add up. And by using jQuery hosted on jQuery.com or Google.com, you get the advantage that the user's browser is quite likely to have that URL already cached because the user has previously visited some other site that's also using jQuery from the same URL. If the URL points to jQuery on your own site, well, the browser doesn't know that that's actually the same thing it already has. It doesn't, it's a different URL, so as far as the browser can tell, it's not the same thing. So it's going to re-download something it probably already has. Any case, moving on. When a library like jQuery runs in the browser, what it does is it defines a bunch of objects and methods for use in your own code and it makes those things available in your code by assigning them to names in the global namespace. Well, in the case of jQuery, it assigns to just one name in the global namespace, jQuery, with a lowercase j and a capital Q. The object which it assigns to the name jQuery is a function object. It's a function object with an object defined in its prototype property, so it's effectively a constructor function. It's a function we call to create objects in this case, what, are, what we call jQuery objects. Now, what a jQuery object represents is basically just a wrapper around one or more DOM elements. In a sense, a jQuery object is a collection of other objects, of DOM element objects. Basically, what's going on internally is the jQuery object has a property, which is an array holding those other elements. And as we'll see later, the jQuery object has a bunch of methods which are useful for inspecting and manipulating the elements which it contains. Now, the jQuery constructor function, like a lot of other methods in jQuery, is pretty heavily overloaded. That is, you can call it with different types of arguments and different numbers of arguments to get different behavior. So here are what are probably the most commonly used overloads of the jQuery constructor function. First off, if we invoke jQuery and pass in a single DOM element, some element object we retrieved, perhaps with, say, document.getElementById or some similar method, well, that returns a new jQuery object which wraps around that single DOM element. So here in the example, if we invoke jQuery with an argument of Christy, assuming Christy is some variable holding a DOM element, well, then this returns a new jQuery object wrapping around that single DOM element. The second overload here is perhaps the one most commonly used where we pass into jQuery a selector, that is a string which uses the same syntax as CSS selectors, and jQuery will interpret that selector to identify zero or more different DOM elements to contain in the newly created jQuery object. So in the example here, jQuery with an argument of a string reading dot orange, that's a CSS selector specifying all elements with the class orange. So this will return a new jQuery object with all elements that at that moment uh, include the class orange. In the third and last overload of jQuery shown here, you pass in a string of HTML jQuery will then represent actual DOM elements representing that HTML. So here in this example, the HTML in the string specifies a div with an ID of high underscore div. And inside the div, there's some text content. There's hello comma space, followed by an anchor tag, a link um, with an href of wikipedia.org slash world and its own content of world. So what that all gets interpreted as is it requires creating a number of different DOM elements. First, there's the element representing the div itself. And inside that div is, well, there's an attribute node 
representing the uh, ID attribute and its value. And then also inside the div, there's a, there's a child text node representing um, the first content element, that, that, that text. And then there's a second child, the anchor tag. Uh, there's, a, there's a DOM element representing the anchor tag with its own uh, attribute node and its own uh, text node content, the word world. So the jQuery object, which is returned by this call, immediately contains just one DOM element, the div, but then that element itself has its own children. So it's the div, and then inside that div element object is everything that makes up the div as written here in the string. Now to create these elements, jQuery itself is using the method document.createElement, and what you need to understand about these newly created elements is that they don't exist in the document yet. We're just creating free-floating elements that aren't attached to any document. Um, we would use other methods in, in the DOM or, or methods of jQuery to actually put them somewhere in the document. We have to attach them as children to some other part of the existing document. Until that time, say, the div we create here doesn't show up anywhere in the document. Now, just as a note, something you need to be really clear on is that the global variable jQuery is a reference to the constructor function for creating jQuery objects. And if you write jQuery.foo, what you're accessing is a property of that constructor function itself. When, though, you invoke jQuery and then access a property from what is returned, that's different. You're accessing a property of that returned jQuery object. So just be clear that jQuery objects have a certain set of properties and the j variable jQuery, that, that constructor function, has its own properties. And one reason this is a bit confusing is because it happens that there are one or two cases where those separate namespaces happen to have the same name. So it could be a con bit confusing at first. Uh, the primary example I'm thinking of is get. There's jQuery.get and then there's the get property of jQuery objects, which is different. So just keep that in mind. Uh, understand that what jQuery has done is they've stuffed a whole bunch of useful things like other functions as properties of this one function object because it just was convenient to do so. They wanted jQuery to show up as just a single object added to the global namespace. Um, and so they just used that object itself as a namespace to contain other things. So when you go to the jQuery site and you look at the documentation for the API, you'll notice that uh, most things listed here are just written as dot and then some method name. Uh, because the vast majority of things in the API are just methods of the jQuery object, those are methods of jQuery objects. Uh, for all other things, you see the full name written out. Like for example here, jQuery.ajax, that is just the name of a function. It's not a method of jQuery objects, it's just a function that for convenience and, and succinctness has been placed as a property uh, inside the jQuery constructor function object, the, the thing referenced by the name jQuery. Dot add, dot add class, dot after, those are all names of methods of jQuery objects. We wouldn't write, say, jQuery dot after because the jQuery constructor function doesn't have a property called after. Only jQuery objects, which we create from the jQuery constructor, have such a property, such a method. Now, I did say earlier that the only name the jQuery library adds to the global namespace is jQuery. That's not entirely true. By default, jQuery will also assign the same object to the variable named dollar sign. Now, you may be surprised to learn that dollar sign is actually a valid uh, character in JavaScript identifiers. Well, usually you're not supposed to use it. It's considered generally bad practice, but the designers of jQuery decided, uh, hey, it's really convenient, it stands out a lot in code, and because if you use jQuery, you're going to be invoking the jQuery constructor constantly, it makes sense to uh, give it a really short, uh, distinct, brief name, and, and what's more brief than just a single character. So they decided to uh, alias the jQuery constructor function to dollar sign. And in fact, it's usual practice with jQuery to almost always use dollar sign rather than write out jQuery because it's just more convenient. So in fact, that's what I'll do from here on out. I'll just simply use dollar sign instead of writing out jQuery.